here I am with the great Noel McCoy. Um, many people know him in his many incarnations from the JT, uh, Cube. JT, JT Cube. Yeah, Cube that's and, right. And so many other things I can't even... Yeah, McCoy, my family group, McCoy, exactly. and more recently the British Collective, yeah. British Collective. I have known you for many, many years. We've just mm. passed like ships in the night. We've worked yeah. in the same places, known the same people, people done yeah. so many things. And, mm -hmm. um, I loved your music. You were someone that I've always looked up to as someone that's just kind of never let your your integrity go in the music mm -hmm. industry, no matter what. And you have so many different faces. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to say it's great to meet you. Mm -hmm. How are you? Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm nice to meet you, Stephen. First, I am I am in good spirits at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So I just you know I, I want to get to the roots of it. You know, mm. um, because this is going to be a series of interviews which will will discover so much about you and everything you've done in the industry mm -hmm. and, and, and and all the great stories that you have to tell. Mm -hmm. Let's start at the beginning right now. Yeah. Um, how did you get into music? Well, the way I got into music was really through my mother and my aunt, Aunt Barbara, God rest her soul. Um, they both sung, came here from Jamaica, lived in Clapham South, and were, was going to places like Stars and Garters, which is a, a TV program where they would feature singers like Madeline Bell, Shirley Bassey, and uh, many others. Uh, so my parents, my mum and sister would go down there um, as time went on, they were getting they were getting a lot of respect. Um, they had to make a choice. Uh, my sister, my mum's sister, had children very similar age to to my mum. So one of them had to go for it, and my mum sacrificed her career and looked after her sister's children, four children. And my mum at the time had about six, I think, yeah, six at the time, including me. Um, so her sister Barbara went on to to get signed to, to Decca Records. She toured with Roy Orbison and people like that. So my point is, is that there were parties at my house and people like, a lot, of, a lot of these stars would be coming there and people I'd seen on telly. So this is how I kind of got the, um, the um, yearning for, to be in the industry. Cause I, I found it exciting at a very young age. I remember a lot of the stuff what I used to see. So that's how I got into music. Firstly, through my mum and my, when, my aunt. You know, like, I started when I was six years of age. Mm -hmm. I cut my first record when I was ten. Wow. Um, I I realized I had something going on when you know people in mm -hmm. in, the, in the in the church or in the in the community centres. Mm -hmm. You know, why are you good? You know, <laughs> yeah. So you get but up until that time, I didn't really sorry, I didn't really know if I was any good. How? When did you begin to believe that you could do this? Well, when. We were leaving the house we were living in, uh, which my mum's sister lived and my, my gran, one of those houses with all the family, big houses. And when we were leaving, I was about seven and uh, we were packing up the stuff. We were nearly ready to go and our aunts and stuff and friends were there and they were crying that we were leaving. I thought we were going to somewhere really far, um, from Clapham South to Clapham Junction. Um, it's not that far, but at the time it felt that. Anyway, I, the, the, there was a track in the background playing called uh, My Sherry and One by Stevie Wonder. I sat on, I stood up on the chair and started singing, started mimicking Stevie Wonder. And i never forget that. They all turned to me and they, they cried even louder and rushed me and all grabbed me and kissed me. And so that little feeling, I took that to, to Clapham Junction to an estate called, um, it went near Winstanley Estate. Um, predominantly Caucasian. We were us and four other families were the only black families in the whole uh, block of flats. It was a massive block of flats. So taking, going down there, experiencing a lot of hostilities. Um, this is in the 60s, late 60s and stuff. But one of the things what I did realize is that singing brought people together because my little friends who I made along the way there, we would sing on the corridors. Corridors had some beautiful acoustics. So. We would sing all of the T-Rex, the, 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 not even the Whalers at the time. It would have been people like Slim Smith and these kind of people. But we knew the whole stuff because we all had brothers and sisters who was playing that stuff. So that's when I knew because my friends used to, you know, show me that. So go, and then going to school in Battersea, they would have cassette players. I'd never really used one before and they used to take my voice. You know, it was the times of the Jacksons and stuff. So I was really um, inspired and confident in myself that I could see my people doing this in America, cartoons and stuff. 
So I, I was really confident. So I, from primary school, they used to take my voice. I knew I had something. My teachers. Uh, so that's when I knew, you know, so seven, me, seven, so why you that kind of. Jacksons and stuff. So let me ask you a question. Did you were you one of them that just watched the Jacksons, or did you watch the Jacksons and the Osmonds, the cartoons? Come on, man! I had to watch the both of them because. I knew what the Jacksons was about and I always wanted to see I used to like um, uh, the, the Osmonds at times, I liked it. Um, I liked, I've always been an open person when it comes to music, but obviously there was a rivalry. But I knew that it was far, you know, we, the Jacksons was on another level to the Osmonds as much as I, I did enjoy long-haired lover from Liverpool. <laughs> yeah, you know? I remember that. So, so, okay, so now you've got to make that leap. For me, to get into the industry, it was a lot of, well actually to be honest with you, the first thing I did was with my family and we started something called like Ellis Five and we used to do Jackson Five stuff and I used yeah. to be Little Mike and, and um, you know, people see you and whatever and then eventually um, you get into the industry, I got into the industry by basically just knocking on people's doors, mm -hmm. the school band and all them things, yep. and just bugging people to let me play, you know, because yeah. I was a drummer and let me right. play, let me play and then just hanging around and, and eventually somebody would say, alright mate, you know, cool, let's see what you can do. And um, oh, you know, if it wasn't there with a raster man saying, why, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. And so, um, so how did you, how did you get, you know. Yeah, very similar, program? very similar. Um, um, going to secondary school, that's when it really started because I, I then met, um, I met more guys, my obviously my age, I'm in the year, but more black brothers, you know, because I grew up in this whole, even my primary school was mainly white, which was, was, was at first it was annoying, but then we, you know, you gain the respect and nobody's still got trouble, but there was a, there was a sense of respect. But going to Spencer Park, I met so many more brothers who would, in the play, in playtime, they would have cassettes and they'd be playing all of the uh, Burning Spear and all of this root stuff, Dennis Brown. And I was like, I, I heard this music from my sisters then, but because these guys are my age, I was like, what? So then by the time we reached the third year, uh, there was talk of people, you know, certain people can play certain instruments because uh, prior to that, in the first year, I was learning saxophone. I was trying to get into the school big band, but it was like a no-go area. I always noticed when they used to do the performances for assembly, same old, same old. And I knew I could do that. Um, it was inspiring, but then it was it was kind of like it, it was annoying as well because I stopped playing sax. I felt like I couldn't get through. But then by chance, the music teacher left, our head of music left. And then another guy came and it was a brother. And this guy, he helped us so much in the sense that he gave us time to rehearse our instruments um, and we got time off because they would come in the, uh, in the lesson, we'd be doing an English lesson, oh McCoy you have to go to rehearsals now and it was like brilliant and then we'd, re we'd perform for all the different houses, the, you know, uh, the assemblies and we got a name, you know, just through that. To this day I see guys who used to go to my school, they never forget that. So we were like, and then I, and I, another thing I, I really noticed, a strong thing was that the teachers looked at you different they would call your name McCoy that's very good and every time you pass the teacher McCoy whereas before didn't really want to know I'm gonna say I wasn't a bad kid at school but I wasn't a kid who was learning enough um, so seeing the difference with that with my teachers and my peers it really sh it, I knew that I could do this thing because I, we were just doing covers um, you know, Orton Ellis, Dennis Brown, all the, all the greats at that time. But they went down well. Um, so yeah, that's when I knew I could do this in secondary school. So yeah, that's very interesting what you were saying about the school band because I, I remember that it was difficult for me to get into the school band. Same mm -hmm. thing, it was the same old faces and I wanted to play and I couldn't even read sheet music. But eventually I kind of bugged them after one term of just incessant, you know, Mm -hmm. of school as they used to call it back in the days you know that they actually wrote music for some, uh, a dusty set of timpani you know kettle drums that they had in the corner just to keep me quiet they just said we write you some music for the for the timpanis you know but i ended up running that school band man you know wow. so after i got in there with the timpanis i took the drummer out of it you know, <laughs> thing, i just i ended up taking that over but but it's always been a struggle for the brothers you know in, the, in those days yeah. to get Definitely. And in fact, um, I'll just add, the music teacher who left, who wasn't giving us the love, he actually wrote one of the themes 
the one what goes do 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 uh, for Doctor Who, he wrote that, um, and uh, Mr. Evans, and uh, yeah, he must have done that because this is in the 70s, so he must have done that after you know he wrote that song. I, I looked it up. So he must still be getting paid. <laughs> Mr. Paid. Evans was the other one. No, it wasn't Mr. Evans. It was Mr. Anyway, his name escaped me, but there were two of them. Mm. So, so obviously, because I, I, I know that you, when you, you started off in, in a different business, in jewellery. Yeah. Um, you know, you used to make cool jewellery. I mean, your family was into jewellery. Yeah, it, that's you know? right, that's right. And, um, and so, jumping, making that transition from that industry into music as a kind of a, a teenager coming into a man. Must have been difficult because you're you're going into the unknown from the known. How, how, how did that work? Well, um, you know, obviously you had to. It was seventies Thatcher era, and there was loads of jobs. So there wasn't any excuse not to have a job. You could, you know, get fired from a job today and start another job the next day. There was lots of work. Um, I did two jobs when I left school. One in the printers. For which used to do album covers and records. That's the reason why I took it. Um, I wanted to be within the industry. That was I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot. And then I did a, a little. I did some uh, carpentry because I was good at carpentry. So um, I did a bit of carpentry with um, a building firm. Um, that never lasted. So I'm like 17 going into me 18. I discovered my brother was a jeweler. He asked me to do a few heron errands for him in Hatton Gardens and the rest is history because I learned so much being around my brother. I started my own business. I had a, a shop, a jewellery shop for a little while. Um, but all that time when I was doing jewellery, selling jewellery, making money, having a good time because now I'm about 18, 19, having, traveling all over the country, doing, having a great time. Um, I was always writing songs. I would always come back home and um, recite my journeys, you know, what I was going through, relationships, characters, etc. So I was always writing. And I was still involved in music because by then my brother and my sister was married to the bass player Matumbi. So I actually I skipped it because when I left school, I worked for Dennis Bavel's Studio 80 in London Bridge. So I left school and went straight into there. Well, my... I've got to cut you there because, you know, sorry, you know, you mentioned Matumbi. Matumbi, yeah. um, people like Ethan Blake, yes. Dennis Bovell, Linda Quavey Johnson, mm -hmm. these guys were very pivotal in my growth music. Mm -hmm. Mine's too. And um, I know that, you know, I spent a lot of time in Sparkside in Brixton, honing my talents and trade, writing, producing, engineering, you know, watching, yep. the, watching so many great, you know, stars and, mm -hmm. and of, that, of the reggae industry coming in before. Mm -hmm. um, and I never knew that you, uh, your family um, originally mm -hmm. were the owners of that. Of, of that yes, of that. My, my family had um, part ownership, investment, let's put it that way. My father invested in that because my sister was married to uh, the proprietor, um, which is Eton Blake. Um, you asked me the question from jewellery to back into music i didn't say the backdrop of all this was sparkside because that was being built that got they acquired that building in late 70s so we had, it was a factory so we had to take out all of the machinery and stuff and then it was it was a studio fully fledged studio um, offices and a little speakeasy bar upstairs by 83 84 so this was the backdrop because i was always going back there you know putting on my overalls and doing my stuff um, backdrop to selling jewellery, etc, etc, making a living. Um, so, yeah, the jewellery, it wasn't a hard transition because you're dealing with people. Um, so, in music, I started to, um, in fact, with, in, at Sparkside, we started a band called Impact. And Impact was, it was myself, Paul Blake, Henry Holder, and myself, uh, yeah, so four of us. Oh, yeah, and Ian Green, he was the fourth member, bass player. So, we started this rock fusion band and we recorded um, when sparks i was finished trident desk everything in there two inch tape uh piano etc we were the first to you know try out this stuff so we were left there we slept at everything there and that's how i learned my craft you know how you um how you deal with studio works you know in the from in the booth 
to the desk what you what you need to sound. Those days there were like loads of sound, you know, they weren't all in the computer, there were like loads of gear. So I learned a lot of stuff in that little transition from 17 to 18. By the time I left Impact about 85. So what made you may I ask you um what made you what made you leave impact? Well what was happening was we were we were getting a lot of attention from lots of labels and um, our manager was having meetings with these labels but nothing came about I and mean, we got quite frustrated because we knew we did a showcase at the fridge and all the labels were there loads of people everybody was talking about it, we smashed it but um, for some reason we didn't get that deal so I decided well the whole band decided you know it's not happening the manager's not so I went off and did I started a band called McCoy. I got my two brothers in and my sister, Jeanette. And I said to the band, will you back us? Will you be? And they said, yeah. So it was still Impact, but plus with my brothers and sisters as singers. And we did we did a couple of couple of gigs. We supported our first gig, I think. No, we we're our first, but I, I put up together a band called The Pasadenas. So um, when they got signed and everything, it was nice of them to invite us on a few of the dates, the tours. So um, that's how the progression from selling jewelry so, would soon be. Uh, wait, so you, you're throwing these things at us yeah. real quick. Mm. But, you know, this interview, and this is about getting to the nitty gritty. Right. You can't just say I created a group yeah. full of Pasadena's. Yeah. I mean, the Pasadena's, bro. Yeah. You know, they were at one stage. The top band, yeah. yeah. They were like five star ones. Yes, you know, so yes, you look yes. At it as almost yes. Like, um, the, something to challenge the, the American yes definitely soul definitely you know, I remember that you yeah. know, they, they obviously didn't quite they did five star but mm. they were on that level mm-hmm. for a while mm-hmm. how did that come about I mean did you, did you just how did you create that I mean well it was quite it was very simple really because um, the Pasadena's used to be called Finesse and Finesse was a dance group excuse me um, I used to book them for various um, um you know, gatherings and stuff, and they come and I pay them and stuff. And um, one day, Michael, one of the, Michael and David, the twins, Michael said to me, we want to do music now. We want to sing. We want to sing. So I said, okay. So I, you know, I hanged out with him. Right, They lived across the road. I grew up with these guys. So I went to his house, showed him how to write verse, bridge, chorus, showed him melody and stuff. Took him to Sparkside, set up the mics for the five of them show them harmony, show them even gigs, getting gigs for them. So I was really involved at the early stage and then obviously uh, Sony was interested. By that time I was, I'd done my bit, let's put it that way. Because the manager didn't really see to where I was, I was trying to explain something because I had, I had all the experience and I was trying to help my brethren, you know. And um, the rest is history, they've done very well but um, I swear, I know if they'd listened to me, they would be still doing music to this day. Um, the place I'm sitting in my studio, one of the guys from the Pasadena's who wasn't from South London, Hamish, he's from Acton around that way. He, great head on him, businessman, hence he's, he's here, he shares the studio with me now. Um, but um, it's a shame, you know, because yesterday, up to yesterday, I, I bumped into this guy and too and he said, why am to the Pasadena's? And, you know, he sees some of them. He actually saw Jeffrey, yeah. Jeffrey's the one who, who we really love personally, you know. He was the one who, who's who got that amazing picture by Jeff Stern when he's like that in the zoot suit. It's a classic picture you see all around the world. So um, that was, just, you know, Pasadena's for the second day run has been talked about. And I'm so proud to have been a part of that that, that journey. Mm. So um, the name, just, just, uh, just in wrapping up the name, Pasadena, where did that come from? Uh, who it came from? Or you mean from the band? Where did you come from? Was it- Not sure. I know it's because obviously it's a place in America. It's a state in America. And because of the quiff and the star where they came with the, the hair I'm talking about, the uh, 1950s jeans, baggy jeans, the, um, this star with the t shirt, this star, I think it has something to do with the Pasadena, that area, what the, the fashion at that time. At least I think because I didn't have nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. All I did was I bought them, to, I took them to places where they could play, showed them how to do it. The dancing, that's all them. The, the songs, it's all them. Mm-hmm. I just taught them out. I taught Michael how to write verse, etc. 
Um, I wish I was a part of it. I really did. They, they brought me in on the second album to do just a few lines of 16 bar on a track. Mm. And, you know, I felt I, 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 I was worth more than that, mm. you know. But, you know, as I said, I was proud to be a part of it. Mm. Do you find, um, you know, because you know me, I'm about the real. Mm -hmm. Do you find that um, a lot of times, or have you found mm -hmm. a lot of times well this is life and of course you know but as you know I've been in the industry for a long time you know so I've seen a lot of this and you know you build a, a shield you build you know it, you, you will be affected by it but it's not as a it doesn't affect you as it as as it um, may have done in the previous uh, experiences of that kind of treatment yeah so you would say that it would be more of a surprise to you when somebody actually doesn't behave like that and actually uh, than when they do when they do that's more normal well uh, you know it's a the business we're in i mean i mean the world we're living in is this way now but we used to always say back in the day music business is a, is a hard business and it's a you know dog eat dog business now we're living in a time like that i can't believe that i'm saying that but it's the truth so being in a business like the music business, you have to be savvy, you have to be strong, you have to have your wits about you. So this will always be, and you know, it does affect you, and it's the, it's the nature of, it, of, the, of the industry, the music industry. Oh, no, um, I'm gonna, I'm, we've got a, a, a long way to go. Oh yeah, we've got more talking like, to do. Yeah, yeah, we've got a lot of talking to do, because obviously, you don't spend 40 years in the industry or more, and mm. then talk for, 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. So, um, so we're going to pick up the story from the Pasadenas and the jewelry going into the music and yeah. you with Sparkside in our next episode. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time mm -hmm. to uh, speak to Shifty no, really uh, like. about uh, this and educate and enlighten the people mm -hmm. because um, this is very important to me um, to get these get people like you out there into the world and show people mm -hmm. how music was actually. Uh, came about in the UK mm. the, the faces and the people behind it who sometimes people don't really know mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm glad to be assistant okay so uh, well um, we'll see you in part two see you in part two Stephen <laughs>